All right, so uh, this is the A10C uh, Tactical DCS training course. Um, there's going to be a lecture component before we go to uh, to get to the flying portion. Um, and uh, I'll drop into that now. I'm going to begin sharing my screen. If someone could call visual uh, when you see what I have presented, I'd appreciate it. Got it. Okay. So <clears throat> as I went through the A10 uh, training course a couple of, uh, of months ago, there were times when I was struggling with stuff and, and that sort of thing. And so I just wanted to kind of go through what resources are available to you um, if you're struggling or miss a class or whatever, right? So first, of course, is the Tactical DCS community. You can reach out to me. I'm at Tory Pine. Um, the other instructor is B-Sky. Um, he just finished the third lesson in the series, but he has been um, a great resource for me. Of course, uh, fellow students in the course, uh, I hope you'll be able to, to reach out to each other. But sometimes someone cottons onto something a little faster than someone else and uh, can help. Um, and then, of course, there are students in B-Sky's course as well. Um, at Mentor in, in the DCS general chat, we'll generally get someone who can... Uh, who can help you out if you're struggling and, and need some uh, um, immediate help. And then, of course, there's the A10C resources channel also in the tactical DCS community. Um, there's the DCS A10C flight manual that comes with, um, with the module. Does everyone know where that is or how to get to it? Yep. Okay, cool. And then there's also a guy called Chuck who publishes a Chuck's Guide, which is sort of an abbreviated and, and application-specific um, thing that, that's really helpful. Um, and so you've got the, the flight manual here. Um, you've got the Chuck's Guide. Um, and then I've also listed a couple of channels down here. Now, these, these, uh, these are two playlists, um, both of which are like four and five years old. Um, and they're of different lengths, that sort of thing. But I have, um, I have never failed to learn something from watching the, uh, the episodes from one of these channels. This is the Bunyap Sims guy, uh, and he has a lot of stuff here. Um, and, uh, he does it while he's flying and, and killing targets and that sort of thing, which is really, really handy and helpful. And then this is the KMBT KRL, um, guy. His are a little longer. Um, but again, you know, take what you can use and, and leave the rest, I suppose. All right. Anyone else have sources of information that I might've missed here? I'll take that as a no. Okay. Yeah, my, my wife, she knows it all. <laughs> I will, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, try to consult her at some point. Cause I, I certainly don't. <laughs> Okay, so um, I sent a message to everyone about the uh, controls to map for this lesson, and it's basically pitch roll, um, you know, rudder pedals, brake, that sort of thing. But the A10C, I mean, they call it the flying computer, and there is a lot of switchology that has to do with, with flying um, this machine. Uh, this is um, a picture of the control stick, and um, sort of all of the the switches that are on it. There's one that's not pictured here, which is sort of which sort of lives on the right side in front over here. That's the master mode button. And what that will do is toggle between um, navigation mode, guns, CCIP, CCRP, or air to air mode. Um, here you have uh, um, on the face of it, you have the weapon release button. Uh, trim is really important because as you're flying, pretty much if you change airspeed, if you launch a weapon, you'll have to retrim the aircraft um, in order to get it to, to fly straight and level. Um, of course, if you get hit with a missile or a gun or something, you're probably also going to have to trim as well. So trim is really important. Here we have the data management switch. Um, and you'll find yourself using this to adjust various displays and move between different options. Um, the target management switch is used to um, effectively change what's going on with weapons and targeting um, is, is the best way to describe that. And then countermeasures. This is how you um, get flat, chaff and flares off the aircraft. 
um, and how you move between different programs of countermeasures. You might have one program for infrared missiles, one program for um, radio, uh, radar guided missiles, these sorts of things. Um, and so all of those are really important uh, for mapping. The one that you, uh, well, I'll, I'll get down here a little bit. This is uh, an image of the Warthog Throttle, and it has a bunch of hats as well. Um, this one is the, the mic button. There are three radios in the aircraft, and this um, selects between the three radios and allows you to transmit. Um, can be pretty important. I think typically we'll be using one radio, but if you get into uh, campaigns and that sort of thing where you're talking to like a, compo a composite commander or even a JTAC on the ground, you'll, you'll find the need to use multiple radios and switch between them. Um, the speed brake, of course, uh, pretty important. The, the boat switch here is not used terribly often. Um, it's really mostly switching display modes on the TGP uh, and the Maverick, and typically you'll set that up uh, once uh, as you're going along and then kind of leave it alone. The China hat is really important. Um, it sort of, it, it has a lot to do with targeting, if you will, and the views that you use for targeting. The Cooley hat is used to switch between the different um, sensors in the aircraft. Um, the slew control is critically important. That's how you'll move missiles and targeting pod around to target different things. Um, autopilot, um, there's one on the throttle here. There's also one just below the throttle in the aircraft. And then the pinky switch. Um, and so amongst all of these things, um, the thing that you don't have to map is the pinky switch. Everything else, find a way to get it done. Uh, because if you're not effective with kind of all of these things, um, you're going to have trouble um, flying the aircraft. And of course, the thing that I, the two that I missed up here are the trigger, um, which is the gun, the, the standout weapon for the A-10 and the nose wheel steering button. So any questions on that stuff? Probably not at this point. Um, and you may... Uh, it is not at the moment, but I'll post all of this stuff after the lesson in our common messaging channel, if that's okay with you guys. Cool. Um, and just so, just so that you know... Um, I don't have a HOTAS system. What I have is this joystick that I bought in like 2002, and the thing just won't die. But between this and Control and Shift and Alt, I can get everything that's on um, the HOTAS system onto this one little one little guy here. So it can be done. You don't have to spend hundreds of dollars on stuff that you can't get right now anyway. Um, and if someone needs help with that, by all means, reach out. Okay, this is an image without the stick around, um, and it's and it's a handy reference. This is for the A10C. There's also one for the A10C2. Is there anyone that's flying the A10C and not the Deuce? Is everybody in the Deuce? Uh, okay. So, so the, the, the thing that's been out for years and years is the A10C. Um, and here, um, at just at the end of, of, uh, of October, um, ED released the A10C Warthog 2 tank killer. Um, and the thing is that some of these button assignments have changed between the original and the newly updated one. And so if you have the old one, use... Um, this to learn what you're doing. And if you have the new one, use this to learn what you're doing. And in fact, with the November 4th up update, um, two, of these thing, two of these things have changed as well. So um, I'll try to get an updated one of, of these uh, when I see it out and around. You'll also find these guys out in the A10C resources channel in the tactical DCS community. Um, 
worked, but just, just for reference, because as we, as we go through this, at least for me, it was really confusing and overwhelming at first and, and being able to look at this uh, stuff really helped. Yeah. So everyone's in the A10C2. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now we're going to talk about weapons and loadouts. Um, and this is, this is kind of the fun stuff. Um, I'm going to start, uh, I, I presume that you guys have flown other aircraft in, in DCS. And so some of this may be applicable, but the thing the the standout star of the show is at the bottom here, the cannon, the Gao 8A 30 millimeter cannon, you get 1150 rounds of combat mix, which is, uh, every five, four out of five bullets are, uh, are, are, uh, armor piercing incendiary or excuse me, are, um, uh, our fragmentation, they're, they're, they're high explosive. And then one in that is a depleted, is a depleted uranium, um, armor piercing incendiary round. And, uh, it is just, I'm sure you've, you guys have already done it. It is all kinds of fun to use. Uh, and the A10C was built around this gun. It's built to employ this gun, um, down to the fact that if you look at the front gear, the, the nose gear on the A10C, you'll see that it's offset to the right. And they did that so that they could run the gun down the center line of the aircraft. Um, and the gun consumes everything uh, forward of the of the of the forward edge of the wing, just about, and under the canop uh, under the cockpit. It's it's huge. Uh, it's about the size of a Volkswagen. Um, all right. So um, starting at the top, we have unguided bombs. Um, some people call these uh, slick bombs. Uh, the Mark 82 is a effectively a 500 pound unguided bomb. You'll use this in the CCP, excuse me, the CCIP mode of the aircraft, um, and it is completely ballistic. It will go where your aircraft was aimed um, when you hit the release button. Uh, and so once you release it, there's there's no changing where it's going. And so there are there is a practice to use uh, to be effective with this munition. Uh, and, and we'll go through that when we get to unguided bombs in lesson three or four, I think it is. The Mark 82 Air is the same bomb, but it has a tail kit on it that that um, inflates a balut, which is a combination. It's a portmanteau, portmanteau of the words balloon and parachute. And basically what it does is, is it increases the drag and retards the bomb's fall. So that if you're doing a low-level bombing and you release the Mark 82 air, it will fall behind your aircraft and uh, allow you get it to get out of the splash damage area. Uh, the Mark 84 is a 2,000-pound version of the Mark 82. Um, it's the big boy, and there is not shown here, but there is a Mark 83 as well, which is a 1,000-pound munition. Um, below that, we have the guided bombs, okay? Um, the GBU-38 and 31 are analogs to the Mark 82 and Mark 84. You can see it's a 500-pound and 2,000-pound bomb like these guys are. And it has a tail kit and a little data transmission device so that this will take a, a GPS coordinate um, and guide this bomb to the coordinate. Um, they are not pinpoint weapons. Um, I believe the circular error of probability is in the range of five meters for these things, um, but they are very good uh, at killing uh, soft armored targets. Um, it won't uh, sometimes kill a true tank, uh, a T-72 or a T-80, something like that, but just about everything below that you can kill with these um, JDAMs. <laughs> There's also a laser-guided bomb, and interestingly enough, if you look at the documentation on these, it has the same circular error of probability around five meters. But you will find that where you place the laser, these things will go. Um, and these are again an analog to a 500-pound and a 2,000-pound bomb. They're a little they're a little heavier because of the guidance kits and the, and the fin kits on them. Okay, any questions about these bombs? Okay, moving on, we have cluster munitions, and we have 
uh, effectively two bombs, and then we have two types. Okay, so the CBU 87 is a fragmentation uh, bomblet. Um, so this is um, a container. It's about a thousand pounds, and it drops off your aircraft, and then at a height of function, which is uh, typically 1,800 feet, there is uh, there are a series of debt cord in this shell that explode and cause this shell to be cut into three pieces. And from there, 120 some bomblets are released. And these bomblets are effectively about three inches. They have a high explosive um, charge along with the shell of the, of the bomblet, which is steel. And they also have a zirconium ring in there. And so that each of those bomblets um, is high explosive. It is fragmentation, so it's good for things like dismounted troops, but it will also kill light armored vehicles like um, uh, BTRs and that sort of thing. Not terribly effective against uh, true tanks and like the BMPs, um, but uh, but it you know it will damage them. You might even get a mobility kill on a tank. I'm not sure how how well that's modeled in DCS, but but certainly possible. The CBU-97 is a different animal all in itself. The, the container looks about the same, and it has the same debt cord and three segments that come out. But, uh, but once, once the shell is peeled away, what comes out are parachute-suspended uh, submunitions. And these things will descend until they're about 150 feet above the ground, and then it will release four little um, hockey puck looking things. And these things will fire um, an explosive charge, which causes them to rotate and they then uh, deploy fins and they have an infrared and laser homing function. So this thing will deploy, I think six or eight of the parachute descending things. And then from there, four um, of the little hockey puck BLUU25, um, I think they're called, uh, submunitions come out, and those will home in on infrared targets like tanks. Um, and so you will literally see the the parachutes will descend, um, the little pucks will pop out, and then and then they'll start. You'll just see them sort of zooming toward tanks and other and other vehicles in the area. It's it's really impressive and really cool um, technology. And those are good against just about any armored target that you can find. And one run with the CBU-97 will kill, you know, two to four tanks, depending upon um, how accurate you are with it. Uh, so the, the book says that they're supposed to cover an area roughly 150 by 200 meters. So 150 meters wide by 200 meters long. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. It, 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 it depends a lot on the angle at which you attack, um, wind in the area, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but that's what the book says. Excellent, excellent point. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that about the crosshairs and the TGP. We'll get to that. Awesome. Sounds like you guys have been studying. Um, the, uh, the next thing down is the guided cluster bomb, um, the WICMID, the wind corrected munition dispenser. Um, and this thing has, uh, sort of a, a, a GPS guided kit on it. Um, and so you'll target it in the same way that you target with the JDAM. And then when you release, it will seek, pardon me, to the, to sort of the same area that a JDAM would. Of course, it's going to start to function at its height of function, again, typically 1,800 feet. Um, but this uh, eliminates the effects of wind. And if you've ever used these, uh, wind can be a very frustrating thing because you can't see it and it's hard to correct for it until you've actually, you know, released the weapon and, and seeing what happens with it. So the first one is kind of a waste and then you can get, get better with the second one. This sort of eliminates the problem. Um, and the good news is that these are plentiful and inexpensive in, in DCS. So, you know, by all means, use those. Um, next down, we have the, um, oh, oh, excuse me. Yeah. 
So uh, in the game, there is not. Um, however, um, TDS, tacti the tactical DCS community runs a Tuesday campaign, right? And there's nothing about anyone spending real money, but in these different campaign scenarios, they will say that, um, you know, a CBU 87 costs $25,000 yeah, and, and this sort of thing. And so it's up to the individual squadrons to sort of manage budgets that they have sort of, um, right, right. But uh, in the game, these cost nothing. Um, and in fact, <laughs> the other great thing, the other great thing is that these, these guided bomb kits, these take like a half hour to install and these take like, you know, an hour to install. Um, and we don't have to wait for the loaders to do any of that stuff either. So, you know, it's just, it's all, it's all gravy for us. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to back up for a second because with the ASA A10C2, there is a new guided munition that looks a lot like this called the GBU 54. And it's a combination of a GPS guided and laser guided munition. So you can use either targeting method with it. Um, if you use GPS guidance, it functions exactly like a GB31 GB or 38. If you use the laser guidance, you can get more pinpoint accuracy like with these guys. Um, however, if for some point, for some reason you have to cease lasing the target, it will revert to the GPS guidance automatically. So you have sort of a flexible targeting function there. Um, it is. That's exactly right, and an excellent point. These are for static targets. These are good against moving targets. Thank you for making that point. Cheers. Okay. Um, any other questions on, on this stuff up here? Okay, we'll continue. We'll continue down to the to the Mavericks. Then the Mavericks are the um, are the outstanding standoff weapon of the A10. Um, you'll see that the um, that the range is seven nautical miles. It's listed here, um, and and that's roughly about the range at which you can use them. Um, I think the book says that their maximum range is twelve nautical miles. Um, however, you'll have trouble getting uh, locks on targets until you get, you know, down below about eight or you know, eight, nine or eight or nine miles, something like that. Um, and when you get a lock, you can you can salvo these things. Um, if you're locked, it's you're good to fire, with one exception, which we'll get into when we when we get into how to how to use these weapons. So there are sorry. Uh, it is slant range. Um, it, it's slant range, but but uh, the good news is that all of the information you're presented when you're operating these, these weapons is slant range. Um, and we'll get into that in a bit more detail in later classes. So um, there are two uh, guidance or two seekers on this. One is infrared and one is electro-optical. And then within each of those seeker types, there are two sizes of missiles. One is about 500 pounds and one is 485 and 670 pounds, okay? The AGM-65D and the AGM-65H has a 126-pound shaped charge warhead. And what that means is that it is effective against pretty much anything. You can hit a tank with that and it will kill it. Um, and I've seen an anecdotal information online, which is, you know, I don't know if that's um, reliable or not, that says that the, the warhead is sort of surplus to requirements. The kinetics of this will kill just about anything you shoot it at. Um, the G and the K versions have a 300 pound, they call it an explosive penetrator. So it's a 300 pound high explosive charge and despite what some may say, high explosives are pretty effective against just about all armor. The good news is that you can hit uh, something with that and it will also kill dismounted troops in the area, right? So you get uh, not just the armor kill effect, but with the larger warhead, you get some fragmentation effect as, as well. And you can see that this, that the heavier warhead includes buildings. Um, so take that for what it's worth. 
Um, the electro-optical and infrared missile, this is basically TV guided and this is infrared guided. Um, they say that the electro-optical missile gets you locks out at, at more distant ranges. I haven't found that to be the case. Um, I encourage you to try it, but I pretty much always mount infrared missiles, even in the daytime, um, just because I get um, better precision targeting with that than I do with the with the EO, with the TV-guided missile. Any questions on those guys? Okay. We have the AIM-9, um, and in the A-10C, it's the AIM-9 Lima or AIM-9 AIM Mike. So it is um, not truly all aspect in the way that the AIM-9P is. Um, these are general. You, you can get a, a, a face shot with these, but uh, better to be rear quarter than, than, uh, than head on. Um, and then we have unguided rockets, and there are a bunch of them here. Um, this chart also doesn't show a couple of rockets that are in the updated A10C2. These are the, the Mark 151L and the Mark 282L, um, and those are laser-guided rockets um, that have an effective range of around five miles. Um, those are those are really, really good and really, really effective. We will go through both guided and unguided rockets, but with the A10C2, I don't know why you would ever take anything other than the laser guided rockets. You know, they will they will act as ballistic rockets if you don't want to guide them. Um, plus, you have the ability to to laser designate um, moving targets and and uh, have some standoff range there as well. So, there is a difference between um, the Mavericks and the the laser guided munitions that we're talking about, right? And that is the Mavericks are fire and forget missiles. Once you lock them on target and fire them, you can immediately turn away from the target or shield yourself with um, terrain or something like that. They will guide to what you locked them on and kill whatever it is, right? With the lasing weapon, with the laser weapons, you have to continue driving in on the target or at least maintaining a line of sight to the target and lasing it while the weapon flies and until it impacts. Um, and, and as you'll see with some of these weapons, that can be quite a long time. And so typically in, in air denied environments where there are air, where there's air defense, either SAM or, or um, anti-air artillery, um, you'll want to use the, the Mavericks to clean up that stuff before you start using the laser guided munitions. Um, either that or with anti-air artillery, you can, um, you can get to um, high altitudes uh, and stay out of their, you know, two or three kilometer range. Um, having said that, the the uh, the A10 is not a high altitude machine. You know, twenty thousand feet is kind of stretching its legs as far as altitude goes, um, and it starts getting a little bit sketchy to control at twenty five. So take that for what it is. There are also illumination flares. Um, these are fun and cool looking, but fairly useless. Um, the, the use for these would be at night if you're going to go in and gun something, um, but pretty much at night using the infrared weapons is, is the way to go. Um, any questions on any of this stuff? Okay. I mean, you're going to cover this in more detail when we're actually shooting and loading the gun. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely. We will get into empl employments in later les lessons, and you'll get uh, you'll get much more familiar with the different capabilities of of these weapons. It is kind of an overview. Um, so the A10 itself has 11, 11 weapon stations numbered you know, intuitively enough from one to 11 and each of those stations will carry different things, right? So you can't put bombs on, you can't put thousand pound bombs on the far out board of the wings, these sorts of things. Um, but as you go through the, the arming, um, you'll be able to see which weapons go where and, and be able to choose your loadouts, uh, with that sort of stuff. Okay. So, um, 
I'm going to get in and go over the A10C cockpit, but I want to expose you first of all to what we're going to be doing when we're flying a little later, right? We're going to introduce it here and then we'll reinforce it. And, uh, and hopefully that will, that will result in excellent performance uh, when you go to fly. All right. So tonight we're going to be flying around Sochi and we're just going to be doing some pattern work tonight. There are four smoke markers at the corners of the pattern, blue, green, orange, and red that indicate climb out, um, uh, crosswind, downwind, um, uh, geez, I, uh, snowman, what's the name of this leg over here? Uh, base, leg. base leg. Excellent. And then final. Thanks so much for that. I was, I was brain farting there for a moment. So, um, and we'll also be, We'll also be practicing um, radio calls for uncontrolled airfields, right? So we'll start in this area here, um, and we'll get our jet started up, uh, and then we'll call Sochi traffic, Torrey Pine, taxiing, parkway, parking to runway 06. And the active ruling for tonight will be 06. It's this one right here. Does anyone happen to know what the converse heading is? That's exactly right. How did you get to that? Right. Cool. <laughs> All right. So we have runway 06 and runway 24. And so when you're lining up for this, right, you, you'll be able to see it, of course, but you want to be pretty close to a heading of 06 when you're coming in on final here. And then when you're on the downwind leg, you want to be pretty close to 24. Of course, the important thing is kind of to be pointed at the orange smoke, but but just keep those keep those two headings in mind, if you will. All right. Um, so taxiing to the active runway, we'll get down here and hold short of the active runway. Uh, check for traffic. Check that uh, you know we're we're configured for takeoff. Then uh, call uh, Sochi traffic, Torrey Pine, taking run runway zero six. Taxi out. Get lined up. Um, and get your brakes on. Throttle up, check that your engines are in the green, and proceed directly down the runway. Now for the A-10 in a clean configuration, um, you're gonna, uh, we're going to rotate at around 125 knots. Um, and the A-10C is, I I'm, I'm searching for a way to describe it, I'm going to say gentlemanly. Um, in that whatever you, whatever inputs you give it, it's going to respond like a gentleman, um, which means pretty slowly. Uh, it's not, it's not a viper. It's not a hornet. Uh, it, it, it moves slowly, but it moves confidently, right? So you'll pull back, um, try to achieve about a three or four, uh, pitch up angle, three or four degree pitch up angle. And we'll go over how to, how to figure that out, um, a little later. Um, and then as it flies itself off the runway, go ahead and, and uh, move the gear up. When you hit 160 knots, flaps up. And then we're going to climb out to 1,500 feet. And 1,500 feet, 210 knots is the target at the blue smoke marker. Um, the pattern altitude for um, fast aircraft, and for this definition, the A-10C is classed as a fast aircraft, is 1,500 feet. Um, Piston-powered Cessnas and that sort of thing are going to be at 1,000 feet. Um, helicopters, um, you know, those sorts of things. Very slow-moving air vehicles are going to be, you know, ultralights will be down at around 500 feet. Um, and that... Outstanding. Thanks for that clarification, Snowman. Um, so pattern altitude for us is 1,500 feet. Um, that is a don't go below level, by the way. If you encroach below 1,500 feet, you're beginning to encroach on the area separated for the slower traffic. Um, 100 or 200 feet is above. Uh, 100 or 200 feet above, you know, we don't really have any, any argument with. Um, but try to keep it above 1,500 feet in order to clear that traffic below you, okay? The other thing is that when you're climbing out, no turns below 1,500 feet. 
we want to make sure that we're at um, our declared pattern altitude before we begin maneuvering. And if you run a little long here, um, before, you know, if you run a little long before you get to 1,500 feet, not a big deal, okay? Um, and I should have mentioned that, that once we get gear up and flaps up, you can increase your pitch angle to about 10 degrees, and the thing will climb out very nicely at 10 degrees, no flaps, and accelerate up to, you know, around, around uh, 200 knots. We're going to commence a 30-degree bank here. And can everyone see my little, um, yep. okay, good, gotcha. good. Okay, so we're going to do a 30-degree bank turn here and work to come onto the downwind at around the green marker lined up with the orange marker. Now, the thing is, if you're going 210 knots, a 30-degree bank angle should put you about exact on this, on this downwind leg. If you're going 180 knots at a 30-degree bank angle, you're going to come in closer, right? And so you may need to ease out a little bit. If you're going faster, which is usually the case uh, in these things, your turn is going to be wider, okay? Um, it's not something to worry about too, too terribly much as long as we're navigating the pattern, but try to be precise. You know, around 200, 210 knots, 30 degree bank angle will bring you here. If you're outside or inside, no worries. Try to get on the downwind 240 pointed at uh, pointed at the orange smoke marker as as um, soon as you can. When we're on the downwind leg, call downwind, um, and then uh, as you as you can um, reduce speed to 190 knots. Get your gear down and flaps in the first position. And then as you approach the orange marker, um, look back. To, to check that, uh, that the airport is clear. Um, make your turn here, and again, at 190, 200 knots, a 30-degree bank should bring you out lined up for runway 06. Um, as you complete this turn, call final, get your second notch of flaps in, and, uh, and start decelerating, okay? So uh, as you're descending, the speed's going to come off the jet pretty slowly. So you may have to really roll the throttle back in order to get some airspeed out of it. The target is that when we're around this area, that we're slowing below 150. And when we're, um, when we're uh, in the green area before the airfield, we're approaching 125 knots. Now, as the aircraft decreases in speed, the attitude, the nose will, it will start to rise into a nose up attitude, right? As it gets slower, the nose rises and you will eventually come into a good on speed approach with speed at about 125 knots and angle of attack at 19 to 21 degrees. Um, and there is an angle of attack indexer in the aircraft that will, that will go over, um, when we get, when we get into this area. Um, what's the other thing that I wanted to say there? This descent from the red mark, if you're at 1,500 feet, the red mark to the end of the runway should be about three to four degrees. Um, and as you come off of this red mark, uh, try to point your total velocity vector at the end of the runway. As you settle in to an on-speed approach at 125 knots and 90 to 21 um, degrees angle of attack, Try to move your total velocity vector up to where the black marks are on the runway so that you're not pointed at the very end of the runway. Your, point, your, your, your position to land is at the black marks. And the reason for that is so that if there's any kind of wind shear event or something like that, you're well over and onto the runway before you get any kind of sudden drops um, when you're near the ground. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Flaring right before touchdown, maybe even putting in a little bit of throttle. Um, uh, you know, if you maintain 125 knots, 19 to 21, that, that on-speed angle of attack, um, you'll get a very gentle touchdown, but, but flaring certainly never hurts. Um, the, uh, the difficulty comes in is if you're a little fast and you go to flare, you'll float um, and proceed on down the runway. Uh, not too worried about that tonight, but just be aware of it. So we're going to do two circuits of this, right? The first one, you'll come in, you'll touch down. 
Um, and then you'll call touch, uh, well, you'll call touch and go, and then you'll throttle up, flaps up one notch, and then go ahead and do another takeoff and another circuit. The second time you'll call um, final uh, Sochi traffic, Torrey Pine, final for runway 06, full stop, come in, stop, uh, and taxi off the runway. When you're taxied off, the, the radio call is Sochi traffic, Torrey Pine, clear runway 06. Any question about that stuff? Okay, cool. Um, the HUD symbology for this, uh, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna leave that for a little later, um, and I'm gonna jump into the um, the sim to go through the the cockpit familiarization. Uh, if anyone wants to take a break for a moment here while I get this started up, uh, now's a good time. Uh, Three four minutes. Yeah, sounds good. And I literally don't know what you're going to be seeing while I do this, so we'll uh, we'll see if we can get it going here. So as someone who presumably has done quite a bit of flying with the A-10 since the tank killer came out, like, do you see yourself ever really going back to the original, or has the tank killer just completely replaced it for you? For me? Uh, yeah, the A-10C2 has completely replaced it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm um, certainly glad that uh, that you guys are all on the, yeah. uh, on the deuce. That makes it simpler for me because there are some... Uh, there are some differences um, that I would that I'm happy to address um, as we go through this, but it's just simpler if I only have to do one aircraft. Okay. So, can you guys see the DCS screen as I'm loading in here? Yep. yep. Okay. Cool. All right, I am going to get into an A10C2. And I can see Snowman over there. All right, so I'm going to try to be cognizant of head movement here so I don't make you guys motion sick. But, uh, you know, I am in VR, which makes it easier for me, but uh, I just hope it's not difficult for you okay so um is everyone here is someone still away yeah no, ruthless may be away still okay cool we'll, we'll wait for that guy to return all right so any questions you guys have thought of on the material we've covered thus far nope okay well then since we're waiting, I am going to show you something that I'm pretty happy about. Request rearming. Copy. <laughs> That's very shiny. Yes. <laughs> Let them know you're coming. Yeah, it's not very tactical, but boy, <laughs> is it uh, in your face. <laughs> And you can definitely see the difference. Oh, I see someone has their ladder out. Here's something I'm curious about. If you put that, if you click the ladder up command, does it go up or do you have to call the ground crew? Rearming complete. I actually Googled it before I did that. You have to call the ground crew. That's what I thought. <laughs> Just as a note, as we're waiting, these both look like pretty simple gauges. The the um, ADI and the HSI, you would literally not believe how much information the HSI can show you. It is a complex instrument. Just out of curiosity, what VR do you, do you use? Uh, I am uh, in the... 
I don't know how you'd say it, the, the direct version, the non-Steam version of DCS, and I'm running the Rift S. Hmm. What about you? So I actually just use Track IR. I actually get motion sickness uh, ah. with the VR rig, so I wasn't willing to risk spending that much money. But mm-hmm. uh, I got myself a 4K TV to play on, so it's kind of nice. Oh, yeah, that is that sounds great. Yeah, I got the index, so I'll be playing on the index. Nice. I have a um, what is it? Odyssey Plus, like the Samsung one. Mm-hmm. But I actually like. I it, it, there's too many compromises for me, so I actually am right now playing on a hat stick, like on my monitor, until I get some probably Track Air Five. Uh, Just not being able to read stuff and not being able to have that kind of resolution for spotting and. Also, being inside the headset, like if you're flying an actual mission, like I have like a notepad and stuff that I like having in front of me to fly with. Right. That is so. one thing that I miss is is the kneeboard kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I was looking. I was going to ask you guys. Uh, I'm 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 like brand new. As you're talking about these taking off and landings, I'm like, man, this guy's got his work cut out. I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I <laughs> you guys have to dodge the flaming, you know, A10 that hits the runway, but yeah. Take off um, is really easy. It's the landing that's the hard part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any landing but... you can walk away from. That, that's the motto. But yeah. you, you were going to say? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was just. I was laughing to myself because I was like, "Yeah, I had my mouse crazily hitting the uh, trying to eject myself, and I couldn't do it. I just <laughs> went down with the bio. I was like, I know. I I like pulled the uh, the uh, fire things while I was flying. Those things right up there on the dashboard. I yeah. pulled those. Yeah, it, it shuts your engine off apparently. <laughs> right. So yeah, I went down slowly with it, trying to say, "I'm gonna fly, I'm gonna eject." Uh, nope, <laughs> couldn't figure it out. So I just I'm just I'm just level setting who you're dealing with here. So yeah, <laughs> enjoy. Well, so that's Control E three times. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm in VR in a motion rig, so there is no keyboard <laughs> there in my immersion. So I'm sorry, no, I'm I've got a mouse and I was on my fingers. Okay, it's happening that way. I'm surprised you could find the mouse then. Yeah. No, I've got it mounted. I got a I got one of the uh, trackballs mounted right next to the stick, so I know right oh, where cool. that is. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I would buy him something in your setup then to eject because... You yeah, well, I just don't do know it. what to do yet. Yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know yet. That's how new I am. So I'll figure all that out. I've got all the stuff to do it. Um, I just don't know. I just don't know what to do with it yet. Gotcha. So I'll use your experiences to, to help me with a good setup. At some point, I'll have to talk to you about your motion rate because that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Truly, really it does. Especially it works with racing too. It's, oh, it's nice. real badass with racing. Has anyone tried like um, the iPhone head trackers or the 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 phone head tracker thing? I, I tried a uh, free track. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say that smooth track app that came out around a uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator release. I tried that and it's fine. Uh, but I mean, I've also got a Track IR Pro Clip, so I just went back to that. I just mostly was trying it out to see if other folks would benefit from it. Yeah, I've got um free track or face track no IR or something like that. It's pretty good again, but it's like I prefer the hat stick compared to that. It's not accurate enough. It's not stable enough. You know, what's a hat stick? It's like the four way sticks on the joystick. Yeah, just like using the D pad kind of to move around. Oh, oh, oh! I got you. I got you. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you manually turn your look with a uh, with yeah. with manipulation. I got it. Okay. Yep. With my thumb. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, is our uh, is our member away back yet? I can't see yeah. the. Uh, I think thanks, so. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. So this is the long, boring portion, um, but but it's helpful to go through the entire cockpit. Okay. So I'm going to look over on the left console, the far uh, back. Uh, area here. Can can you guys see my cursor moving around? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So this red button back here is the arm ground safety. If you flip this up and flip this switch, you can use your weapons on the ground. Um, <coughs> not not really not really useful <laughs> unless you're testing the gun or you want to shoot a squadron mate or something. You know okay, what I mean? So you start- <laughs> There, that's where I'm starting to. I'm going to test that out. The first thing I get is don't get in front of me because I'm testing that out. The second I get there, I had no idea that existed. 
Um, so we have a, an anti G suit thing back here. We have a light. We have a paddle, a piddle pack. This is if you need to go pee in the jet. All this stuff is, is kind of non functional. Um, moving up here, you have various antennas. Um, these, this is, uh, I, I've never used it. Um, it's for uh, selecting antennas and erecting them. This, uh, the stall and uh, peak performance uh, volume thing, there is, as you're turning the aircraft or maneuvering the aircraft, there's a solid tone and then an intermittent tone that comes on. Um, that tells you when you're getting close to stall or, again, peak performing the aircraft. If those get too loud, you can turn them down with these two knobs here. Um, in front of that, you have sort of the audio source uh, and volume um, buttons. Um, it's the same panel in the A-10 as in the A-10-2C. The difference is in the two, the ILS and TACAN are pushed down, which means they're muted. So when you turn in, when you tune in to like a TACAN, um, you used to, by default, hear the um, the Morse code beeps, and you won't unless you um, uh, raise uh, that button. Okay. Ahead of that is the uh, emergency uh, flight control, uh, emergency reversion control panel. So if you get stuff shot off, you can use these fl these switches to um, disable the automatic trim um, functions in the airplane. Um, there are two channels for each. You can see left and right um, for most of these things. Um, and then you have a, a manual trim button here. So if you disable the auto trim, um, this is how you trim the aircraft. Ahead of that, you have the IFF panel. Um, this is non-functional in this sim. Um, what happens is that if you get uh, an IFF query from a friendly force, they will magically get the correct response from you. Um, and enemy forces will, of course, not magically get the, the correct response. Ahead of that, um, there's the um, stability augmentation system panel. Uh, so this is the panel where you engage the left and right channels for pitch and yaw stabilization. Um, there's a trim, a yaw trim, um, a test button, uh, which I believe is non-functional. And then this button right here, the takeoff trim button, this is really important. We'll push this um, each time before we before we take off. And this sets takeoff trim for the aircraft. Ahead of that is um, a panel that has night vision lights on it, uh, weapon station status lights, and the HARS slash SAS override uh, switch. Um, the night vision light panel uh, light section is non-functional in the sim. If you put on night vision, I, it just sort of magically adjusts, I think. Um, and then the refuel status indexers. None of this stuff really needs to change. Um, HARS is a gyro navigation system that is separate from the one that's mostly used on the aircraft. So when you're, you're on the ground and you start up the aircraft, you'll be in HARS navigation mode, and then we'll switch it into EGGY navigation mode, and that that uh, switches to the second, more precise um, alignment uh, hardware, if you will. There are two warning test buttons here. Um, this is sort of a, an all, uh, all warning lamps uh, test button, and this is a, a, a fire and bleed air test button. And the, all these do is um, sound um, warning horns and illuminate um, panel lights. That's all that they do. Returning back to the back, we have the KY58 uh, encrypted communications panel. Um, and they changed the way that the switches are configured in the A10C2, which is kind of superfluous because this function is not modeled in the aircraft. Um, ahead of that, we have the VHF-2 radio. I believe this, uh, the frequency here is 30 to 72 um, megahertz. Um, and it's turned on using uh, this switch here. You'll turn it, turn it to one click to transmit, receive, um, to get the radio turned on. And then just leave it. In, well, there are various tuning modes here. FM. Um, emergency, AM, manual, and um, the preset uh, tuning 
um, uh, mode. There's also a load button to be able to load presets um, and volume and this sort of thing, a volume and squelch. We don't really use those very much. And then turning these with either a right or left mouse click will tune the radio uh, to the frequency that you're uh, interested in, in tuning to. So that's uh, VHF2. Ahead of that is the UHF um, uh, radio. Um, typically to turn it on, turn it to the, the main channel. There's also a both, which, which monitors both the frequency that you're communicating on and the UHF guard. And there's also an ADF, automatic direction finding uh, function as well. Uh, typically we use TACAN uh, for direction finding, but ADF is there if ever you encounter the need for it. We have uh, manual preset or ground for uh, talking through the intercom. Um, typically leave this on manual and just tune it. Um, there are, these are the, the tuning uh, buttons, uh, the tuning rotaries, I guess I would say, uh, to tune this radio again, right and left clicks to increment or decrement uh, tuning numbers here. And then under this uh, panel, flip up panel, is the load button for loading presets. So if you tune to a frequency, tune to a preset, which is changed on this on this knob up here, and then press the load button. It will load the frequency shown here into the preset shown here. This blank panel is a placeholder for the new radio we're getting in the Warthog 2 that isn't here yet. Um, and then ahead of that, we have the VHF number one radio. Now both the VHF one and VHF two radios, are they're both VHF, but they operate in different frequency domains. So this one can be tuned to like 124 megahertz in the same way that this one can. However, if you turn this one into this range, you'll get a warning tone. And the same here, if you tune this one down into the range that this one occupies, you'll get a warning to tone. It's annoying, um, but you'll know immediately if you do it. The controls on this are the same as the controls on this, and I should have said that you can right and left click um, the rotary here to get preset numbers as well. Okay, ahead of that, let's see if I can move the throttle here. Ahead of that is the... Um, this is a control for the, uh, it's the Enhance Attitude Control and Lasty Control page. Enhance Attitude Control is sort of a, um, it's an auto trimming system um, for attacks, essentially. At any, uh, um, it's a precursor to the Gun Precision Attitude Control. This is enabled by default, or excuse me, it's enabled as a matter of course before takeoff. Here we have the radar altimeter uh, on and off. This is in the A10C2. This is positioned to norm, and we should leave it there. You have the autopilot engage button here, and then the autopilot um, mode button. And there are three different modes for the autopilot. There's altitude hold, which is handy, for instance, if you want to get into a 32, 32 or a 30 degree bank and just orbit. You put this in altitude hold mode, establish your bank, and turn the autopilot on, and it will hold you in that bank at the correct altitude uh, sort of magically. And it's really handy when you're setting up weapons or spotting targets or something like that. The second is the altitude heading hold. So if you're on your way somewhere and you want to stay at the same, um, the same altitude, uh, point it where you want it to go, get it straight and level, put it on altitude heading mode, hit the autopilot button, and it will take you, it will continue on that on that heading at, at a constant altitude. And then ahead of that is the path hold button. And so this will allow you to hold climbs, um, you know, turns, these sorts of things that aren't altitude constant. Uh, there are limits to that. You can't point it 30, 30 degrees up and put path hold. It will refuse to engage. So I think it's 12 or 15 degrees above or below vertical um, and 30 or 45 degrees in, in roll. But within those, the path hold is, is pretty handy if you want to you, you know do a constant speed, constant speed spiral climb or something like that or a constant speed um, climb um, out of a out of an airport or something like that that's that's the the thing to do um, ahead of that you have the the throttle panel 
The throttles, I think, are pretty self-explanatory. Move them forward for more thrust, move them back for less thrust. To the left of that, you have the flaps setting. Um, and I don't know if, I guess you can click these, but but mostly this these are mapped to a HOTAS function. And you can look down here to see what state your flaps are in. There's also an indicator over here uh, on the uh, front panel for flaps. This indicates the position of the external flap. This indicates the position of the control setting. And um, above about 195 knots, you can move this and the airplane won't move the external flaps. So this could be in maneuver and the flaps will show completely up here until you get below 195 knots or some such like that. Okay. So this will show you what the setting is. This will show you what the aircraft is actually configured for. All right. To the um, right, there is a, uh, to the right of the throttles on the rear, there's a landing gear warning horn silence button. So as you put the gear up or down, it will sound a warning horn. If you don't like it, you press that button and it will go away. You have a throttle friction increase or decrease, you know, in the real plane. I'm sure that's important, not so much in our sim. This switch right here is important to us. This is the auxiliary power unit start switch. And this is important in starting up the aircraft. This is how we get um, bleed air and electrical power in the aircraft um, without any ground cart, any, any ground in interaction, if you will. Above here, we have the motor ignition override. So we'll go through how to start up the aircraft. And basically, if you move the throttles in the right sequence of events, it will auto start the engine. But for instance, if you have a hot start, moving one of these to the motor position will spin the motor without supplying fuel. So it will clear the fuel in the engine uh, to, to avoid a hot start if you have some sort of failed start condition. And then the forward um, ignition is helpful if, for instance, you're flying and you have an engine failure and you want to reignite it and you want to restart the motor. Just moving the throttle isn't going to do it. You'll have to um, switch this um, switch forward in order to get the ignition started. And you can start off of the right engine bleed air or start the right engine off of the left engine bleed air. Ahead of that, you have the engine fuel flow. There's normal uh, to the front and override to the rear. This basically disengages the RPM limiter computer for the, for the engine. So if you have a damaged engine or you have a damaged, um, what do they call it? A damaged uh, amplif amplifier circuit. You can switch this to override. It doesn't really give you any extra thrust. What it does is it slaves the performance of the engine to the throttle. Um, so that if there's some electrical system um, failure in between this handle and the engine, this will make that electrical system failure go away. That's pretty smart. Yeah. So ahead of that, you have the fuel control panel. Um, in the A10C, uh, we, have, we would have to manually turn on these boost pumps at startup. In the A10C2, it's done for you, which is nice. Um, ahead of that, you have um, things that are used for refueling and sort of special refueling circumstances. Um, if any of you know much about the A10C, uh, we don't really need to refuel. Uh, this thing has a dwell time of like four hours when f when fully fueled, even with a load. Um, but um, it is helpful to know what these things do. Um, the, the, the tank gate open and close um, uh, is basically for uh, filling uh, wing tip or wing mounted tanks or, or center line mounted tanks. You turn external tanks on here. So this this enables fuel flow to all tanks. This turns on. Um, the wing tanks or the center fuselage tank. So this and this will, f will fill the wing tanks. This and this will fill the center line tank. Um, the airplane has two completely independent fuel systems, left and right. If for some reason your left side booster pump gets, gets shot out or fails to function, you can enable cross feed and the right side booster pump will feed the left engine or vice versa. Okay. We have the signal amplification over. Have you ever used that? Have you ever used that? I have not. I have not. Okay. The signal amplification override is not, not functional in this sim. 
The line check is a test function. I honestly don't know if that works or not. Um, and then we have fill disable buttons here. So if, for instance, you have a hole in your left wing and you are refueling, you can fill disable uh, the left wing, the left, or excuse me, the left wing tank, so that you're not um, putting fuel into something that's just going to leak out. Same thing for the right. Same thing for the left and right side channels on the main tanks. Um, the rotary here increases or decreases the brightness of the light in the refueling uh, in the nose refueling area, and then this lever opens or closes the refueling door on the nose. And if you move it to open, autopilot will not engage. And if it is engaged, it will go off. If it's not engaged, you cannot um, engage it. So you cannot use the autopilot when the refueling door is open. <clears throat> okay. Over here, you have an emergency brake. Um, so if you have, uh, if you're landing damaged, you know, gear up, something like that, you have another way to brake here. We have seat raise and lower in this switch over here. Click it up to, to raise the seat. Click it down to lower the seat. Um, here we have a function for... Does that adjust your VR view? It does, yeah. When I've got power yeah. to the aircraft and I click up, my seat literally raises up like Man, this. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is pretty cool. Um, this, this thing here records the... Um, the recording function of the airplane. There's um, a digital tape that uh, sits in the air aircraft and will record either the TV monitor image or the HUD image. And you can have off standby or record. We don't really use this in in the sim. Um, it's just ex you know uh, surplus to requirements, I guess I would say. Okay. Any questions on the left side panels over here? Yes. Okay. My, I'm raising my hand literally. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm that student. So, of these buttons, you know, like I said, you know, I'm a total noob. What should I be mapping, or what am I using often? What area am I going to be con? You know, like if I'm looking, like, oh shit, what's this thing on the left? What am I snapping my eyes to as a, a landmark to then adjust to all the other components there? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. what is the, what are the, you know, the you know, what do you guys do when you look down? You're always looking to this because you're always pushing that button and then you you know you're going to move from that point up or down. Right. So on this panel, to answer your first question, what would I map? I would map the throttles uh, to an axis so that when you roll it forward, you get mm -hmm. more throttle. And when you roll it back, you don't. I would map the autopilot engage button to something. And I also have mapped the different autopilot modes. So with my hands on the stick, I can change to an altitude hold mode and engage the autopilot. Um, and that's really about it. Everything else... Are those typically on the HOTUS or the stick that most people generally map, map that kind of thing? You know, honestly, I don't know. Um, I only have a stick. So, so for me, mm -hmm. it's all shift trim hat. Um, gotcha. And shift nose wheel steering. Um, but, uh, I got you. Yeah. Okay. But, but in the real aircraft, this red thing here is the autopilot engage button. So it's on the throttle. And oh, it's I, on the throttle. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then I would imagine the pilots just reach down here and flip the switch cause it's, you know, pretty close, but yeah, I don't know. Got it. For the radios, okay. turn them on once typically tune them once or twice in the mission. So if I need to change a frequency, I'll just look over and like, click this thing up or down right uh, we're not yep. we're not doing that so much that that we need those things mapped um the other thing that i would map is in the real airplane this black conical thing here on the throttle is a radio transmit switch and so i have on my hotas i have a push to talk mapped and then i have a radio select map so I'll select the, UH, the VHF-1 and push to talk transmit on that. Select UHF and then push to talk on that kind of thing. Make sense? Gotcha. Okay. Yep. One other thing that I neglected to cover was this button right here, which is the ejection seat arm button. Um, and that's one thing that we'll uh, try to remember to do before we take off because if you don't you can't eject it doesn't it doesn't that's matter what it was then it doesn't that's matter what it was. how many yep. times you press that's control what happened. <laughs> that's what happened i was clicking that like mad and it wasn't doing anything i'm like oh 
All right, well, I'm going down with the plane. So just as a, an aside, the crypto, the, the KY-28? The KY-58, I actually, yeah. Or 58, excuse me. I got in the habit of turning that on, mm -hmm. and you say it's non-functional, but actually when I was playing in multiplayer, it was sending only static through SRS, and I was getting quite a few people mad at me because I was basically, you know, blowing them out with static. Really? That's crazy. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. That uh, might be like a server-specific thing, too, because I've read some servers specifically have, like, plugins that can check for that, maybe. It was the Uber but, server, so... Okay. Engine, we should try that, then, once our jets are on, if we're communicating through SRS. Yeah, I'd love to try that. Yeah, thanks for... Yeah, uh, I got I got the answer from Siri Bob, so... Yeah. Nice. What's a Siri Bob? He's the guy that makes SRS. Oh, sweet. Oh, pardon me, I, I should like have... an Apple thing. <laughs> I should have uh, um, had you answer mm -hmm. that question. I apologize for stepping in there. Okay, so front panel. Uh, you know, the front panel gauges are here for a reason. They're the they're the things that you will use to to uh, control and fly the plane uh, most often. Uh, the The focus of your attention, of course, will be the HUD up here. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so starting lower left, I'll move up and over and down, and then we'll go up to to the to the HUD. Okay. So over here, we have a Thames data reset button. Um, that is for ground crews to get diagnostic information from the engine management software, not modeled. We have the flaps indicator. This will always show what position your flaps are in, regardless of what position the, um, the command uh, button shows. And these two can disagree depending upon airspeed, okay? Um, above that, you have the landing gear status lights, two main gear, and then nose gear. The anti-skid switch, this is something that we will turn on as part of our taxi um, and takeoff um, uh, uh, checklist, uh, because anti-skid is, is, it's like... Um... ABS. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Canopy jet. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, it's... I clicked it and was trying to unclick the button, and I accidentally pulled the lever. <laughs> what, what, was it, that was him next to you? Yeah, yeah. See, that guy doesn't have a canopy anymore. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, we'll get a new plane real quick. <laughs> the good news is the maintenance time is about 30 seconds. Yeah, it's, yeah the maintenance here is really great. All right. So anti-skid oh, is, uh, is uh, uh, yes. Um, what did you say? I saw nothing. I was saying that you can still see the canopy under my new jet. Oh, yeah, I saw that, yeah. Um, so anti-skid on. Um, this controls the nose gear lights. There's a taxi light at the bottom and a landing lights at the top. Um, I don't care which. The landing lights turns on two lights. The taxi light turns on one. I don't really care which, but have a light on when, you, when you've got the gear down. Um, down lock override. If you're having trouble getting the gear to get down and stay locked, press this. Um, so start a dive, press this, and then pull up, and gravity will put your gear down and lock it, okay? Uh, command the gear down if it doesn't work. Dive, pull up, you know, get some G on the jet and push this button, all right? And then this is the landing gear uh, up or down lever here. Typically map that to a HOTAS. Um, okay. Um, moving to the right um, this here is the armament HUD control panel. Um, and starting from the top, we have master arm. It has three positions, um, which are train, safe, and master arm. Um, with the switch, in, and with all of these, with the switch in train, you'll get the HUD symbology as if you're making a real attack, but you won't get any weapons coming off the jet or guns firing or anything like that. Safe. You will get warning messages about weapons if you try to use them. In Master Arm, everything is on and live. Um, I don't know why anyone would use Train in here, but uh, can if you want. Gun Pack, we have uh, Gun Arm, Safe, and Gun Pack Arm. And the difference between the two is this pack, and that is the Precision Attitude Control. So what happens is, if you're running in on a target you can press the first detent of the trigger when gun pack armed is, is um, enabled, and that will 
use a computer to maintain trim of the aircraft. So if you um, enable gun pack arm, run in and press the trigger to the first detent, the, the, the plane will fly as if it was on a rope between you and whatever your noise with nose was pointed at. You can make small changes. And in fact, you can make large changes, large changes. But the, the purpose of that is so that if you get the pipper on a target and press um, gun and press uh, the trigger to the first detent, the plane will fly like it was on a laser to wherever that pipper is pointed. And then you can press the trigger a couple of times and pull off kind of thing. It's uh, it's truly impressive. Um, um, will it still do that if you only have a one stage trigger? Like if I just pull stage two of the trigger, will it automatically activate that while I hold the trigger down? Uh, the book says yes. The answer is cool. I don't know. Um, I, I have actually mapped um, the first stage trigger to a control control trigger so i press down on the control key and pull trigger um and the one of the reasons is because it's also useful to stabilize for bombing um so if you're doing a ccpi ccip delivery you can stabilize the aircraft with the pipper on target in case you want to dive a little more before you release kind of thing or let the plane get a really stable release um attitude if you will does that make sense Mm -hmm. okay. that's all that's right where you're pointing now right in there yes the gun pack arm so up is with the precision attitude control on and down is just gun arm there's no precision attitude control mm -hmm. okay laser arm um the 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 plane itself doesn't have a laser but the targeting pod does and if you want to use the laser to designate targets this must be on and then we have a TGP on. The TGP is um, is a loadable store, but in effect, it's it's like an integral part of the aircraft. I can't imagine a um, um, an eventuality where I'd want to go out with without a TGP. So, when you have a TGP, flip that on. Okay. Below that, we have three buttons in a row here: the altitude SCE. I don't know what SCE means, but uh, it uh, altitude source is what it means. <laughs> Look at that helpful text. So at the bottom, you'll get um, altitude from the radar altimeter, um, and that's good when you're near the ground. Above 5,000 feet, this will register uh, XXXR. Um, and also, if the aircraft rolls more than 45 degrees away from the ground, in either direction, the radar will also show uh, an XXXR uh, altitude. The next is delta, so you'll get the difference between the radar altitude and the barometric altitude, and full up is barometric altitude, and this is what we typically fly. Um, we'll get to the HUD in a minute, but you can have it on barometric altitude, and then you will also get a radar altitude indication when you're under 5,000 feet. Okay. Over here uh, is the HUD mode. You have a day-night switch. Um, night makes it go amber, sort of a yellowish color. Day is a green color. It doesn't decrease the brightness at all. Um, if you want to decrease the brightness, there is a switch on the upfront control, and I'm trying to move slowly. This intensity rocker here will allow you to adjust the HUD brightness to be either brighter or less bright. Yeah. And then norm and standby basically just turns the HUD off. HUD off, HUD on kind of thing. The three switches below that um, turn on um, several of the computers in the, in the A-10. We have the kick you, the control something computing unit. Uh, so as part of startup, we'll turn this on. The JTRS, the Joint Tactical Radio System, this is the data link. We'll turn that on. And then the IFFCC, um, which basically are, are all of the sort of attitude indicating systems. This is what um, sort of provides information to the HUD. So as part of startup, we'll turn that to test. We'll come up here and hit enter and let it run its bit. And then we'll turn it all the way on and we'll get a fully functional HUD display. Okay. Moving up from there, we have the left MFD multifunction display. This rotary turns it between day, night, and off. 
there is a huge difference in brightness between day and night. And in fact, at night, it is still too bright most of the time. So um, if you're flying at night, this brightness rocker and the symbology rocker are very helpful to get something that won't hurt your eyes. Um, contrast is here. Um, moving map scale adjust and uh, in effect, there's a different thing that we use to, to adjust the scale of the moving map. Around the perimeter of this, you'll see buttons. These are called OSBs, and they are soft buttons. They are numbered from 1 to 20. From this button at the upper left, proceeding right in a clockwise fashion. So this is button 1. This is button 6. This is button 13. This is button 19. Yeah? And, and you can see the labels if you hover over them kind of thing. Yeah? Questions so far about sort of this side of the panel? Do those, how, how often are you using those dials? I mean, when you're talking about the dials for the, the brightness and those type of things. Are you using those often? So uh, effectively once per flight. Um, when you turn okay. it on, um, you'll adjust it and then typically fly with that. And, and frankly, during the daytime, turn it on today and it will be fine. If, okay. if at nighttime you're flying and you turn it to light tonight, this still hurts my eyes. And so I have to adjust the brightness and the symbology okay. uh, just just to make it so, you know, I can whatever, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Moving to the left, there are two <clears throat> indicator lights here, and they're not illuminated. This is the gun-armed light, and this is the nose-wheel steering light. This indicates if the gun is ready to fire, and this indicates whether or not you can steer on the ground. Um, in all the other lessons that I've been present at, someone has taxied into the grass over there uh, because they forgot to enable nose wheel steering. So before you taxi, make sure this is on. And we'll go through a, a, little, a little method to, to ensure that before you get too far along. The thing is, with the A10, if you go into the grass, you're going to have to restart. Um, and grabbing a new jet is fine as long as you're not started up. But the startup in this thing takes like six minutes. So if you taxi into the grass, it's 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 a painful penalty, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> just just below those two lights are the um, radar warning receiver, and there's a brightness adjust here. This will show you threats um, that are radiological or, or, or radio frequency in nature. Um, there are a couple of things to know about this, um, and that is if you imagine a 45 degree cone. Uh, that's from the center of the top of the aircraft and pointed up and from the center of the aircraft and pointed down, it doesn't perceive threats that are directly above, below or directly above the aircraft. The sensors are on the out, outboard of the tail, the tips of the wings, um, a, a position on the nose, but they're not on the top or the bottom of the aircraft. And so if you have something that's either directly above you or di directly below you when you are flying or rolling or pitching or whatever, it won't be shown on this display. Now, if you notice, there is an outer circle and an inner circle. Okay. So um, a lot of people think that, that, this, that, the, that the difference between the center position and the outer position indicates distance. It does not. It indicates signal strength, and yeah. and typically um, what what happens is that this the, the aircraft's computer has enough information about um, opposing weapon systems that it can det it can determine from signal strength whether something is um, a threat to engage you or just a threat to be monitored. So if something appears inside this inner circle. It is a threat to engage you. If it's in this outer circle, it is it is just a threat to um, to be wary of, right? Um, and then there are different symbols for and different warning tones for whether something is just tracking you or whether it has locked you. Um, there is also an indication for missile launches here, um, and and there's also this little ML light here for missile launch. But you'll see it both here and a flashing light here. So explain how that isn't distance then. Sure. So let's say that um, we have a SAM that is, hang on here a second. Do you guys see the F-10 map? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. okay. Let's say that we have a Sam over here in Gantiati. Um, do you see my cursor there? I do. Okay. That is, we'll call it five miles from the airport, right? Mm -hmm. You also have a ship that's 15 miles off the coast. Okay. Now a SAM radar is effective, but it's not really high powered. It runs on a mobile generator and all that sort of thing. So this SAM radar may show, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go back into the cockpit here for a minute, right? So the SAM radar may show here because it's outside of our engagement range and it's a pretty, pretty uh, weak signal from five miles away, right? The ship being 40 miles off the coast has a much more powerful radar. And so even though it's farther away, it will appear closer to us in terms of it closer to the center. Oh, even in your threat range. Okay. It, it may, you know. it may be in the threat range, right? But it's, it's based it's on technology's reach ability to you. Yeah, kind of. Right. And so, gotcha. and so the, the distinguishing thing is outboard are threats to monitor inboard are threats to be really concerned about. And then the, the distance between the center and the, and the perimeter is really about signal strength, not necessarily distance. Okay. Got it. Yeah, I get it. Okay. So below that, we have our airspeed indicator. Um, you have the white, um, the, the white um, indicator, I guess, which will proceed around here to 100, 150, 200, 250. This yellow indication is the area, uh, that's the gear speed. If, uh, if you're above that, probably best not to put the gear down. Um, flaps are around 160. Um, uh, to, to move them up. Uh, tire speed, I think, is 162 or 165 knots, um, and that changes with load. Um, so if you, if you land fast with, a, with, a, with lots of weapons on or, you know, whatever, you can, you can crack your tires. This um, striped indicator is a max airspeed indicator. If you go beyond that, and you won't get this this aircraft above about 430, 440 knots, um, it will give you an overspeed uh, auditory warning, but that indicates the the max airspeed. And then this dial in the middle is um, a, a port a, a digital indicator. So if if we're at 150 knots, the the numbers five zero will be under that white arrow at the top there. Make sense? Mm -hmm. This is our standby attitude indicator, um, pitch, and then the little uh, arrow down here is roll. We'll cage this when we get to start out by rolling this up and then rolling it down. Um, and when the aircraft is turned on and this is at the horizon, that little red flag will go away. This is a repeater for the frequency that's tuned on our UHF radio, which is the middle radio back here, kind of the big one. So if this shows 251 megahertz, this will also, also show 251 megahertz, okay? This is a clock. It has both um, uh, uh, a standard daytime and also an elapsed time function. This is the angle of attack indicator. Now, the angle of attack is pretty important when aviating. Are you guys familiar with the concept? Okay. Um, yes. So the angle of attack is defined as the difference between the difference in angle between the relative wind and the mean cord line of your airfoil. In in this case, the wing. Um, so if you pull back on the stick and the nose rises as you're flying forward, the angle of attack of attack will increase as the wing starts to move uh, farther and farther up, right? And if you pitch down, the angle of attack will decrease. Um, this is important because it has to do with, with drag and particularly at low speeds. Um, the angle of attack is, is critically important in managing the flyability of your aircraft. There are markers over here um, for different things. Uh, the thing I'll call your attention to right now is the sort of the large um, rectangular marker here. This is the area that, I, that we'd like to be in when landing, okay, to have this um, indicator pointed in this area that indicates a proper attitude or, or nose up um, uh, orientation of the aircraft for landing. Okay. Um, the HARS fast erect button over here uh, has to do with rapid alignment of the secondary um, 
um, attitude and positioning system on the ground, you'll never use that. And then, of course, vents. All right. Any questions on this stuff over here? Okay. How are you guys doing? Uh, you need a break? You doing okay? Could take it or leave it. Okay. Uh, I, I'm doing okay. I'm just going to take a sip of water here. Um, are you learning anything? Yeah. Definitely feel like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So in the middle, this is the SCMS panel um, or the something countermeasures repeater panel. Now, actual countermeasures are configured down over here in the countermeasures um, um, CMSP, but this is the SCMS panel. And so this will show you um, what mode your jammer is in. And so if you're equipped with a jammer, this will show either air-to-air, -air, SAM-1, SAM-2, or AAA. Um, and it will also indicate whether or not um, the jammer is operating. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, later. This indicates this is the missile warning system. Um, and I'm trying to think... What is displayed there? We'll have to come back to that. This is the brightness for these displays, and this is the audio, um, the, the volume of the alerts that are generated by the RWR. There will be a, a bunch of beepy, 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 and if it gets too loud, just reach up and, and turn this down. These three buttons here um, configure the display of the RWR, okay? So if you press pry, it will show the five highest priority threats. It will clear everything else out. So, and this, these are the five highest priority threats that the computer thinks you're facing, right? So if, if you've got, if you're full of, if you've got this display full of stuff and you want to know what's going to kill you right now, press the pry button and it will clean it up. All right. The SEP button uh, just sort of separates RWR symbols. So if you're approaching like a target area that has an SA-15, an SA-6, you know, a, and a bunch of stuff, a ZSU-23, you know, a clamshell, Big Bird, some SA-10 over here, and it's all sort of right in this little area, if you press this SEP button, it will break those things out so you can see which kind and how many you're facing in that, in that area, right? So if they're all there and overlaid, you press the set button and it will kind of separate them and, and show you what's there. The unk button will display unknown threats. I haven't actually seen any unknown threats, um, but uh, I presume there are some out there because there is a button for it. Um, the missile launch button, this will flash red when a missile launch is detected, uh, and a tone will sound, a missile launch tone will sound. You'll get to You'll get to identify that tone um, almost intuitively, you'll have sometimes a, a physical reaction to it. Um, but uh, it's important to note that that indicates all missile launches, including ones, uh, including missiles launched by your flight mates, including missiles launched by friendly SAM batteries on the ground, right? So that, that, uh, that warning going off doesn't necessarily mean start hitting chair and, uh, chaff and flare. Um, but it does mean pay attention to what's going on. And the, and that warning is the reason that we call out our missile launches. So when we launch uh, a Maverick, we will call rifle to alert our flight members that there is a missile launch happening and that they shouldn't be too concerned about it. Okay. Above, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the top uh, display here displays the um, mode of countermeasures dispenser that we're in. And I'm just going to transition over here. We have standby, manual, semi-auto, and auto. And that will be displayed on, on the left side of this display. And then you'll have a number of chaff and number of flare that you have left to dispense in this area. Very handy to know. Below that, we have the ADI, the attitude and direction indicator. There's an artificial horizon here, which will, and, and uh, a pitch ladder, which tells you um, degree of, of climb and bank. Um, below that, there is a roll indicator, and this white bar will move to indicate degrees of roll, five, 
is it? No, it's 10, 20, 30, 45, or excuse me, 45 and 90. Um, this W here is what they call the, the waterline mark. This is an indication of where on this pitch and roll horizon your, your aircraft is. Um, the red flags indicate that the, the, um, the instrument is off and shouldn't be paid attention to. And then you have these yellow lines. And most of the time, these, yellow, these two yellow lines will be not visible. They are for the instrument landing system and show you um, uh, the degree to which you're deviating from the preferred glide slope for instrument landings. Below that, you have a turn and bank indicator. This indicates an uncoordinated turn. Um, to be honest, uh, this isn't really terribly applicable in the in the A10 because it has um, an auto coordinating computer. It will automatically coordinate your turns without having to use rudder. But if you see this ball move outside of there and stay outside of there for a while, it means something is screwed up on your aircraft. Um, and then this just adjusts. Uh, where the horizon meets the, the water line here. So if it's off, you can adjust it to be back on. Below that is the horizontal situation indicator. Um, this has a whole lot of information on it. Um, you wouldn't believe how much this can indicate. I encourage you to go read the manual on this. But basically, it shows you um, your, your aircraft is represented here. Um, and this compass card indicates what direction your aircraft is heading. The um, the indicator here, the the fat one with the with the line indicated uh, indicated, is something that you can use to set a heading with. If you can see, I'm turning the setting heading set knob. So if you want to be heading 30 degrees, you set that there, and then turn the aircraft until it's pointed to that to that thing. Okay. There is also a um, a course set knob, so you can you can set this to a course that you want to follow. Um, perhaps 90, uh, and uh, and this has to do with uh, TACAN alignment, which we'll get into a little later. Um, and so it will show a course, and then you can also get distance from, from TACAN markers. And then it's hard to see, but on the outside here, there are also two other indicators, a numeral 1 and a numeral 2. The numeral one always points at the selected steer point, and we'll get into that in basic navigation. And then the, the number two indicator can point at sort of other things, if you will. Um, there's also uh, a line, uh, the, the dots here um, indicate a deviation from, uh, from a selected desired course. Um, and that's kind of not all that this can, that this can indicate. It, it does a lot. Um, below that, you have a, a panel which sets different um, navigation modes. Um, we will be working mostly with EGI, um, which is the, the preferred navigation mode for the A-10. HARS is that sort of backup second system that's engaged on the ground. TIZZLE is not used. That's the old Pave Penny pod um, uh, selection. And then down here, there are different things that you can use um, to select how this thing um, displays information. So, for instance, you can have it have this display information relative to the anchor point, which we typically know of as the bullseye, while your HUD indicates steer point information. And then, of course, TACAN and ILS beacons. Okay. Below that is a blank panel that used to be something else, and then fuses. Uh, any questions on this center stack here? Okay, moving on. Yeah, just real quick on like where are your eyes. Are you are you are you in the HUD when you're flying normally, or are you bouncing down to that that those two? Um, in the center stack the adi and the hsi um yeah i am typically on the hud uh the only the tip uh, there are times when i'm looking at the hsi but that's typically when i'm working to fly a radial on a tac can 
or some other kind of bearing uh, or some other kind of navigation setup, because okay. this this will indicate course and distance and deviation and these sorts of things. When you're trying okay. to find a tanker, this is really really handy because they're hard to see, and if you tune into their beacon, this will guide you right to them. Got it. Yeah. Very okay. handy. Okay. So it's it's kind of functional for for what it does. Oh yeah. Maybe not all app uh, does it not all. Okay. Got yeah. It. Cool. Yeah. Uh, any other question? Good question, by the way. Okay. Um, uh, moving to the right, I'm going to do this upper panel here. We have a vert vertical velocity indicator. This indicates how fast you're climbing, diving, or um, or flying straight and level. And this is in thousands of feet. So if this needle is pointing up here, you're in a 2,000 feet per minute climb, which you know you might be concerned about because you'll you'll run out of airspeed. If it's pointing down here, you're in a 2,000 foot per minute descent, and at the, attitude, at the altitudes that we fly at, that uh, that's concerning because you will soon impact the ground. Um, here you have um, uh, your altitude indicator um, in uh, hundreds and thousands of feet, and, and then you have a digital repeater here. Um, it currently indicates that it is using a pneumatic source. You can change it from a pneumatic to electric source, of course, when the aircraft is powered on. And then you can use this knob to change the reference pressure that it uses to establish attitude, right? So this is above ground level, right? Because right now we're basically at zero feet on the ground. And then this would be some other reference, right? Like maybe sea level, because we're about 100 feet, 98 feet above sea level at this airport. Okay, so this is how you would change that um, pressure reference. Snowman, anything you want to add on that? Okay. No, it all sounds good to me. So to the right, you have the right MFD, uh, very much like the left MFD in terms of operation, but you can display different sets of information, and you can literally switch the display here over to here. It's just two displays make it really handy for... Um, for managing the, the systems on the aircraft. Okay, below that we have engine gauges and they're duplicated because we have two engines on the aircraft. We have the, um, this is essentially the, I, I think it's the interstage turbine temperature, the ITT. We have the turbine um, velocity in, in RPM and then we have the turbine pressure in PSI down here. Um, and you'll grow used to to what um, these things look like as the aircraft goes, but these paints on the on the edges of the gauges are very helpful and handy for determining when there's a problem. Over here, you have fan. Um, so the engines, the TF-34 engines, are what are called high bypass engines. So you have a turbine, a small turbine in the middle that provides power, and you have a big fan at the front that basically just windmills windmills air through the engine. And 85% of the thrust comes from the bypass portion of the engine, not the turbine portion of the engine. So this fan speed is really important. If this goes down, that means that you're losing thrust from an engine. Uh, mm -hmm. Fuel flow gauges for each of the engines. And when you are setting crews, um, so sometimes it's helpful to tell somebody, particularly information flight or whatever, what speed you're flying at. But um, if you're similarly loaded, you can also tell them what fuel flow you're, you're setting at, and that will help them figure out what to do in order to match your velocity and, and endurance and all that sort of stuff. Below this, you can see that there's a, an outline around these two gauges. These are the gauges for the auxiliary power unit, um, the exhaust gas temperature, and the APU um, percentage RPM. I guess this is EGT up here, not ITT. Um, but uh, these will indicate the, the function of your APU. And typically, we look at this one. When the APU starts up, it takes a minute, it goes to 100, and then we can start doing other stuff. On the far right, we have two hydraulic systems. They are duplicated. Um, one hydraulic system will run most of the things on, you know, most of the things on the aircraft, but this allows you to man monitor both the left and right channel. We have the fuel gauge. When the aircraft is fuel, it can is full. It can hold a maximum of 11,100 pounds of fuel. You have the left system indicated over here, and the right system, in, excuse me, obverse, 
converse, left system, left system, left system indicated here, right system indicated here. And then down here you have the source that, that, uh, drives this gauge. So right now it's set to wing and wings can hold, I think, 2,500 pounds of fuel each. So you'll see that if it's set to wing, the, the gauges will be over here. I like to turn it to int, which is full internal fuel. That's typically how we run, and it will show you how much total fuel you have on the, on the aircraft. The test button, if you press it, will cause the gauges to reflect about 6,000 total pounds of fuel on the aircraft. So the... the um, Needles will move down to around the 3,000 pound range, and this will show 5,900 pounds, essentially. Okay, any question on the stuff over here? All right, moving to the top. Over here, we have the emergency stores jettison button. If you push that, all of the expendable stores will be jettisoned from the aircraft. There are exceptions to this. It won't jettison, um, uh, excuse me, it won't jettison sidewinders. It won't jettison the targeting pod, and it won't jettison the ECM pod. Apparently, our lives are not worth more than an ECM targeting pod, an ECM pod, a targeting pod, and a, and a couple of sidewinder. Um, moving to the right, we have fire engine poles for the left engine, the APU, and the right engine. If you have a fire in one of these things, these um, handles will illuminate, um, and you can pull them. Understand that when you pull them, it doesn't extinguish the fire in the engine. Um, what it does is it cuts off fuel to the engine, uh -huh. uh, and it, it selects a destination for the fire extinguishing charge. Okay, and you can move this button left or right. Okay, that now what that means is that doesn't mean that you have a charge for the left engine and a charge for the right engine, it means you have two charges. So, if you pull the left engine handle and hit this one way and the fire doesn't go out, you can move it the other way and it will send another extinguishing charge into the left engine. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have two total charges, and then these handles indicate where that fire extinguishing charge will go. It works. Yeah. Two. <laughs> All yeah. right. Cool. It, wor it works. I can attest to it. Just above that, we have the upfront control, um, and this is just uh, an in visual range way for pilots to enter information into the CDU, the central data unit computer for the aircraft. Okay. Um, we have a button to cycle through steer points here. We have the HUD intensity here. Um, you can move through pages and the bit tests and this sort of thing here. Um, the things that I want to call your attention to are the enter button, the function button. So if you push function and three, you will go into the WP or waypoint page of the CB CDU. If you press function and um, sys, you will go into the system page of the CDU. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. If you uh, press the letter, it will allow you to enter M, N, or O. And if anyone's old enough to remember T9 texting, where you had to press five three times to get an O, that's what this does. If you press letter and then five three times, you'll get an O. Wow. Makes sense. And then if you do nothing, it will just put numbers in. Clear will clear the last entry for uh, in the scratch pad for the CDU. And then these other things are, we'll, we'll cover them a little later. Okay. Above that, you have the hub, the heads up display. This will, we'll, we'll go over what information is presented on the hub a little later. Uh, upper left, you have an accelerometer. This will tell you um, how many Gs positive and negative you've pulled. And there is also a maximum positive and maximum negative G indicator in these little arrows here. This is the angle of attack indexer. It will tell you, tell you whether you're high and fast, low and slow, or on speed, on angle for um, land, approach and landing. On the right side, you have the um, backup compass. Of course, the primary compass is down here on the HSI. Um, this one is, you know, in in visual range and, and a backup. You'll notice, though, that it kind of floats and bobbles around and that sort of thing. If you want a reliable heading, look down here. And below that is the refueling state indicator. And you'll have ready, ready to connect 
latched or disconnected down here. Um, that's for air refueling. Okay. Any questions on that stuff up there? Good. We're coming to the end, I promise you. <laughs> okay. Over on the right side, I'm going to start with the outboard, outboard panel and move forward. You have the exterior lighting control panel here. Excuse me, this is interior lights, my bad. And, and the different instruments, uh, brightnesses for different instruments here. Um, you also have signal lights bright um, and um, accelerate. This is actually an external light, um, and this is an external light. Um, then you have external lights panel, uh, steady formation, anti-collision, or excuse me, um, position uh, formation and anti-collision. Uh, a lot of people will try to turn this on, and it will immediately revert back like it's doing now, as opposed to this one, which will go forward and stay there. Uh, and the reason is because you have to have pinky switch aft in order to get the anti-collision lights on and functioning. So if you ever wonder about why that doesn't go on, move your pinky switch aft and that will happen. Um, in this area, we have the environmental controls. Um, nothing really much to to work at there. Um, we turn the pitot heat on on the ground uh, at startup. Uh, that's really the only thing that we that we work with there. Ahead of that, you have the um, oxygen generation uh, system. I guess it's uh, liquid oxygen. It's not oxygen. It's not OBOGS. It's a, it's a bottle. This tells you the pressure. There's a test button, um, and then um, uh, a configuration for flight. This is all configured, ready to go out of the barn for the A10C2. It used to be in the A10C that you would have to turn this on, or if you flew above 10,000 feet, you'd start to uh, gray out kind of thing. Ahead of that is the electrical panel. We'll be using this um, extensively uh, during startup. Battery power on and off. Emergency flood. This is the only switch that will work without battery power. If it's at night, this thing will be dark. And the only switch that you need to find first is this one. And if you turn that on, then um, floodlights will come on and it will show you where all the other switches are. So you can turn on battery power and start getting things to, uh, started up. Okay. So start up, we'll do battery power. We'll turn on the inverter. Um, we'll turn on the APU. And then once the APU is up, we'll turn on the APU generator. Okay. Ahead of just that. A, yes. This is a point though. Uh, a couple of the floodlights for that emergency flood are actually on the canopy. So you, if you have the canopy open, you won't have certain areas illuminated. Oh, correct. And, and a good point to make. Thanks. Uh, another thing to note as well is if you hit left alt and L, it turns on a flashlight that follows your mouse around. That's what I always do on a night start. Oh, nice. Left. Um, Sorry. It might not be in the A10, but in the Hornet, the top, a left alt and L, Lima. Okay. So... Uh, shift and H also gives you the night vision goggles. That's what I use. Nice. Lots. So you guys, you guys are already already uh, well well used to this aircraft. Then canopy jettison. Can anyone tell us about canopy jettison? Oh boy, I can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, this little. That's what it says on the box. <laughs> So there is a button that you have to push in here, and then you left right click it, I think, and it and it pulls out, and uh, then the canopy will jettison. Uh, under this uh, red but red cover here is a button to extend the boarding ladder. I think people have already done that. Once you get it down, you have to have the ground crew come over to to uh, put it back up. Canopy open and close. You have to have. I thought you had to have battery power to get that going, but I guess not. Um, and you have to hold it, or you can just press. Uh, control C and it will it will the canopy will close. Okay, going to the rear again, you have the HARS um, alignment panel. This is if you ever have a disagreement between the HARS and the EGI, this will allow you to align them or dial in errors or this sort of thing. Never use it. It's functional, but we never use it. This is the Scorpion HMCS control panel. Apparently, you do have to change batteries here, but uh, the big thing that we do is turn this on and. That's about it. Ahead of that, you have the TACAN configuration. Uh, this will dial into different uh, tactical air navigation frequencies. And the way that you do that is you can roll this forward or back 
to adjust the uh, channel here. And then this one has both an inner and an outer. So the outer selects X and Y, the inner selects the minor unit channel. And that's how you do that. Volume will increase or decrease the volume of the Morse code. And then over here is the selection of mode for TACAN. You can have, so there, there are two. There's uh, receive and transmit receive for ground, and then receive and transmit receive for air-to-air -air sources. These would be like tankers. If you turn it on receive, it will give you a direction uh, to fly. Um, and if you turn it to transmit receive, it will give you both direction and distance. And that works for both the ground and the air-to-air -air function. Okay. ILS, instrument landing system, um, the power is on the outer one on the left side. I don't know if you can see that turning on or off. Let's see if I can get back on there. There you go. And then the inner thing uh, selects the, the, the major units uh, channel. Over here, minor units channel and volume. Okay. Ahead of that, um, I'm going to cover this whole thing. Uh, as one unit. This is the CDU or central data unit. And this uh, controls a lot of the targeting and navigation for the A10. Um, we'll go over this in the basic navigation lesson. Uh, what we need today is turn the CDU and the EGI on. That's it. Um, and we'll cover the rest in a different lesson. You have the warning annunciator pattern here, pa panel here with all the warning lights. And then you have the countermeasures um, configuration and control panel here. Um, and this configures chaff, flare, um, missile warning, and electronic countermeasures jammer um, and RWR. Okay. Any questions about that stuff? <laughs>